Welcome to the Blockchain All-Star Series. I'm your host, Layla Gulen. Blockchain and distributed ledger technology are at the forefront of the Internet 3.0 era, where the technology enables trusted and transparent sharing of data and digital assets. Though the technology is still in its early stages, who makes up the constellation of innovators guiding us through the digital revolution powered by blockchain? We'd like to welcome Henry Arslanian. He is the PricewaterhouseCoopers crypto leader and partner, the former chairman of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong and an adjunct professor at the University of Hong Kong. He joins us now. Thank you so much for being with us, Henry. Thanks for having me, Leila. Well, first, congratulations on being named the number one most influential individual on finance globally on LinkedIn. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, a lot of hard work goes behind the scenes. You know, I think for anybody who produces any type of content, including yourselves, I think you understand the amount of hours that goes in. And I think what people often don't realize is often happens in evenings, the weekends. Uh, but I'm very happy to see that the, the, the audience and people are getting value out of it, which is the most important thing. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Uh, with half million uh, LinkedIn connections, uh, that is certainly quite impressive. You're uh, up against a pretty stiff competition. Uh, you'll also have at least 40,000 subscribers to your newsletter and counting uh, before we dive into fintech and blockchain, we'd love to learn more about you and what led you to where you are today. So uh, I'm just going to kind of open it up here. Uh, where sure. did life start for you, Henry? <laughs> well, thank you very much. No, my, my really, my, you know, I tell people my, my real passion is really the future of finance and the future of money. And I'm just very lucky to be able to make a living out of it. I wear many hats, as you mentioned. You know, I'm, I'm PwC. I run the crypto business globally. It's actually a practice that I started 2017 where I told uh, many of my fellow uh, uh, you know, colleagues that I wanted to launch a crypto or a blockchain team. And people thought I was about to launder money or sell uh, g- service uh, drug dealers. And of course, things have changed quite a lot since then. But also, I'm a professor at university, as you mentioned, where since 2015 at the University of Hong Kong, I teach the first ever, uh, the first university, uh, fintech, the first fintech university course in the world, actually, uh, which has been not going on for, for many, many years. Uh, but also, obviously, like you mentioned, author, where I write many books. My last book here, The Future of Finance, became a, a global bestseller. And actually, I'm working on my next one coming up soon on the future of money. And of course, I think many people know via my social media and some of the content that I produce, including my uh, crypto capsule show, which is a 60-second summary of the global developments going on in the world of crypto. Uh, really, all this happened. I'm, I'm originally from Montreal, Canada, uh, you know, the French-speaking part of beautiful Canada. Um, and I come from a typical Armenian family. My background is Armenian, a uh, Yamania for those uh, in, in China. And basically, uh, you know, I became a lawyer uh, when I was uh, I started became a young lawyer and then you know I was you know very keen to go abroad and I was very fortunate to have studied and lived traveled a lot when I was uh, young and I left for China and I did a learn Chinese and I did a degree in ma- a master's in Chinese law at Tsinghua University again this was earlier on it was before China became on the front scene everybody made fun of me half of my friends thought I was going to Japan uh, the other half really thought I was completely crazy but at a time you know we focused on uh, the corporate governance on the Chinese securities market uh, so you know it was really a great time in China and then obviously I moved to uh, Hong Kong uh, where I started working as a hedge fund lawyer really focusing on the, on the crypto uh, sorry on the asset management sector financial market And really how I discovered that crypto was very interesting was about 2013 where, uh, you know, I was just very interested in, I was working at an investment bank at a time. I was working at UBS and I was, I was looking around me and I was like, it's impossible. These things need to innovate. It doesn't make sense that we are still operating the way we are right now. Uh, at a time, if you want, it was right after the financial crisis, uh, really Uber and uh, WhatsApp, all these apps were just starting. Uh, and really at a time, I realized this is a, something that needs to change. And the way I discovered the, the Bitcoin was in 2013. Ironically, I used to be the president of the Armenian community of China at a time. And we just did our website. And my CTO, my voluntary CTO, was mining Bitcoin since 2011 in his, in his apartment in Hong Kong. He, he actually <laughs> sold them when it was $30. He was very proud of it. Of course, a very bad mistake when you look about it, when you think about it now. <laughs> yeah, but he, he, started, he got me into it. And I really, at a time, I was um, I was the head of financial services of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce as well. And I organized my first Bitcoin event in really in, uh, in January 2014. And at the time, I remember at the time, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong received complaints 
from members saying, how can you actually hold an event on a topic like this that is really but for drug dealers and stuff like that? So it's very interesting how things have changed since then. Um, there you go. So it was, uh, it is, uh, it is what it is. 2007, since 2017, I'm really full time in crypto at, at PwC, where I launched the business of uh, the crypto team. Uh, I'm 100% focused on crypto. 100% of my clients are crypto, uh, and really, this is really what I what I focus on. I really believe today it'll be very, very difficult to get me to do something else but crypto, just because of all the excitement, and interest, and everything going on right now in the world of blockchain, a DLT, and frankly, I think we're very lucky, Layla, that all of us, even everybody listening to this podcast in this video today. We are the lucky generation who, when we look at the history of money, we are really able to be part of rebuilding the future of finance or future of money. And that's super exciting. I appreciate your positivity when you speak of being in, in a time and a place where we have boundless opportunity. Because I think a lot of people, they don't see the forest for the trees. They uh, feel a little... Uh, negative when it comes to the outlook on finance. You are a financial renaissance man, quite frankly. I'm curious, was this something that ran in your family? Is that why you decided, I mean, you said you started in law, but you also just took to the world of finance like a duck to water. So I'm curious um, if this is something that ran in your family and there's influence behind it. Well, you know, it's interesting. I always think, even to everybody who works in my teams, I always tell them you have to you have to be a paranoid optimist, uh, <laughs> and you need to be always sitting on the edge of your seat and everything you do in life. And I think this is what uh, always uh, it was you know it was really been driving me since I'm a kid. You know, it's interesting you mentioned my family. You know, my family has been uh, for five generations were born in different countries. Actually, my family is uh, was in, actually was originally we've been for centuries in a city in what well, current day Turkey called Aintab, uh, Gazi Aintab. And then after, after the Armenian genocide, my family was entirely massacred, lost everything, went to Syria where they had to restart from scratch. And then because of changes there, they had to move to Lebanon, so restart from scratch. And then there was a war in Lebanon. They had to move to Canada and restart yes. from scratch. Scratch, and I was I was I had, to, I had, to, I had to move to Hong Kong and literally almost uh, you know redo my life. It's actually funny. Uh, we've been five generations where we were born in complete different countries. Uh, you know, my uh, my great grandfather was born to, uh, in, in in Turkey, current day Turkey, and then in Syria, then in Lebanon, and Canada. My kids are born in Hong Kong. Where their kids were born, I don't know. But really, the the lesson here was always, I think, in life, uh, you know, as soon as you become complacent, you become comfortable. I think you immediately lost. And I think this is why the, the, what has driven me, I would say, not only in finance, but really into fintech and blockchain and decentralized ledger technology was always what is happening, what is coming and are disrupting the status quo. I will never forget that when I was at, working at UBS, I would meet a lot of these senior bankers that were very comfortable. And the one answer that drives me nuts is when people tell me, when I propose a change, they always tell me, well, that's always the way we've done things. That for me is when you immediately failed. And, uh, you know, whenever I teach my classes on fintech, uh, at the, the last class of uh, the last session of every, uh, uh, class that I have, I always put a chair in the middle of the class and I sit on the edge of it. And I tell my students, if there's one lesson you have to learn from my class, always sit on the edge of your seat. You know, Layla, today up to this day, you know, after despite everything that I do every month, I have a one hour blocked in my calendar, uh, every month. I will go by myself, actually, without a cell phone. I bring a notebook with me, which I have here, actually, this notebook, and I come with me, and I literally think about how am I being disrupted in everything that I do in life, what is being, what is disrupting me today? And always, that's how I always continue, continue to innovate. So believe it or not, to this day, I do this religiously every month. Uh, so always sitting on the edge of your seat and being a paranoid. So, so disciplined, so disciplined. Now, when you say what has disrupted your life or how you endeavor to disrupt the status quo? Uh, I think if we look at the status quo, let's look at finance today. I actually think the way, uh, whilst a lot of things have evolved in life, uh, the financial services ecosystem has not evolved. And frankly, uh, the people who are paying the price for this are the people who can afford at least. Let's look at a very simple example. Let's look at cross-border payments, for example. Today, Leila, the average fee of a cross-border payment around the world is right under 7%. 7%. In many emerging markets, by the way, it's double digit. Uh, the reason it's 7% because between the G8, it's less than 2%. So for example, today in the US, 
If I send you a payment within the US, it's not a big problem. You could use Venmo, PayPal, and the likes. It's the same thing in China. You can use you know, uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay, without no problem. As soon as you're moving around the world, the money across border, it's a big problem. Today, is over 250 million migrants that are sending over $500 billion a year. And, and in many cases, it's double-digit uh, fees. And that is absolutely unacceptable. I find it's unacceptable that an era where I can send you a WhatsApp message, I can send you email, we can have these recordings for pretty much for free around the world. Sending you money is, is such a problem. And this especially affects immigrants, uh, foreign workers, and literally the people who can afford it the least. And then I find is as a society and as a financial services professionals, we have failed. And this is why I find it very exciting about the whole world of blockchain and centralized ledger technology is for the first time, we have a fighting chance to actually solve this problem and bring it up to speed with all the other advancements advancements, advancements what we're having around the world in other technological uh, verticals. That's marvelous. Um, as a citizen of the world, uh, what drew you to the Far East to continue to build your career? Um, you know, I was uh, I was very very lucky when I was the, when I was younger in my younger days. You know, I used to do m- multiple jobs like many students do. I used to work in security, I used to work in pharmacies, I used to wash cars in the car rental shops, and literally every single dollar that I would make, I would save them and I would use them to go travel. I remember I did the whole, you know, from Latin America, I did the whole Che Guevara trip to go across the country uh, to go to Europe and so on and so forth. Uh, and really the way uh, Asia happened was a bit of a fluke. Again, talking about being a paranoid and up, you know, always on the sitting on the edge of your seat. Uh, at the time, I was, uh, when I was in university in Canada, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, I, was, I was quite good in school. Actually, I finished the number one of uh, not only my class or my year or the law school, I finished number one of the university. University when I was in Canada, thus I even got a medal from the Governor General of Canada for that. And really, when I was, I was, I was very fortunate to work for one of the best law firms in Canada, which for many people would be a very comfortable life. You come in and you go up the ladder; it's very comfortable. Uh, but again, at the time, I was looking and saying, "What is really happening? What are the big changes happening around the world?" And that's how China came. I will never forget what I was. I was at my parents' house uh, watching a documentary in China in French called uh, "Le Réveil du Dragon Chinois," which is the the wake up of the Chinese dragon. At a time, I was supposed to go to uh, LSC to do a master's in finance and accounting. After I saw that documentary, I literally, and I kid you not, went in my room, put my application for LSC in a drawer, started Googling. At the time, Google was just starting uh, programs for in China. And literally, the next day, I bought a book called Chinese for Dummies. Uh, and then I was a week later, I was on a plane to Beijing. I couldn't sleep. It was next to this grandmother who taught me to count from one to 10. Uh, I arrived at Beijing. This was the old airport of Beijing. It took me four hours to go to my university. At the time, it was Beijing University, Beida. And uh, really, I think it, was, it changed my life in many regards. And I think this is this um, at a time around the world. Uh, obviously, China was coming at the forefront. And this is actually why I'm a big fan of BSN and all the innovation that it's bringing as well. Uh, and I you know the, I think the, there's no doubt in my mind the next century is really going to be the Asian century. And that obviously will bring a- along a lot of um, turbulences like we've seen over and over, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's financial and others, uh, especially when it comes to blockchain and DLT. I think one of the biggest mistakes that happens in the West, if we can call it like that, is people don't appreciate the level of technological advancement sophistication and R&D that is, that is taking place, not only in China, but across the region. Uh, and I think that's what people are going to realize over the next couple of years. And I think, to be honest, I think the BSN is a very good example of that. Even what's happening in mainland China right now with ECNY and the China CBDC efforts, which are years ahead of any other developed country. So I think this is what attracted me uh, to, the, to the, what, the, 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 the East from that perspective. Yes. Uh, very interesting, you know, and also complacency that we were talking about earlier. It seems like it's just constantly moving at the speed of light. And when you hear about a lot of these technologies, they are emerging from the Far East. Uh, and are you finding, though, because still the world is learning about crypto. So what do you think are the challenges that this type of trading faces? What this type of technology? How do you ever overcome those hurdles? Absolutely, Leila. I think, you know, one of the biggest hurdles we have is obviously we are early at the very early days today of the crypto revolution, if you want to call it like that. I mean, to put things in perspective, in, you know, mid-2020, there was about 100 million people who had an account at a crypto exchange. Uh, the latest data we have as of the summer of, of 2021, there's about 220 million. So we went from 100 million to 220 million, literally in about nine months. Uh, and I really believe that, you know, as we embark on our journey of having a billion users around the world, a lot of things will be required. One of them, and the most important, is education. 
Uh, this is why I tell everybody is that, you know, even when I deal with a lot of banks, a lot of boards, a lot of CEOs, a lot of central bankers, regulators, uh, I tell them, you know, you, you may love Bitcoin, you may hate it. You may you know love blockchain, you may hate it. You may love even CBDCs or you may hate them. But I think all of us, we have this intellectual duty. And kind of uh, for those of them, for those people who work in companies or fi- banks, I believe you have a fiduciary duty towards your shareholders to at least try to understand this technology. And then you can make your own decision, but in an informed way. Uh, and, you know, the one advice I give to everybody, you know, is on, on a weekend, on a Saturday, spend one hour instead of watching stupid Netflix or Amazon Prime. Why don't you actually go on YouTube now and learn about these technologies? Back in the day when I got into crypto in 2013, we had to read a lot of technical white papers. It was actually quite not easy. It was not user friendly. And today there's actually a lot of content that is available uh, literally for free in a very easy to consume way as well. Uh, you know, or, so even if a case in point, even myself, you know, being a professor for so many years, uh, not only I write books for the topic, uh, but I even have now numerous uh, YouTube channels. I mean, for example, I have now a lot of educational content on YouTube that I give away for free uh, with the goal to empowering people to understand. And not only I make it available for free, but actually we spend a lot of money and time to translate it to multiple languages. For example, all my educational content now is available not only in English, but also in Chinese and French and Arabic and Spanish. We need to try to empower as many billions of people as we can around the world. So one word to take away on this is education. Learn about it. Put maybe a bit of amount of money in crypto or, you know, buy, buy some assets in the space just to experiment it, you know, because then you'll have some skin in the game and you'll want to learn more about it. And I think that will already get you more knowledgeable about, about the ecosystem and the potential of this technology. Yeah. Do you think, do you foresee and how long do you think it's going to take for the average investor, let's say, uh, to have cryptocurrency in their portfolio alongside Coca-Cola and, and some of the other investments? Well, I, th- I think it's uh, the uh, I think the, the when we're going to have a lot of let's say the people of Western countries hold crypto as part of their portfolios will happen sooner rather than later for a couple of reasons. Uh, really, over the last two or three years, uh, I think buying digital assets has been way easier than it was in the past. Uh, not only many of the mainstream brokers are offering crypto, but also there's a lot of numerous exchanges that are available, uh, including countries like the United States, for example. A uh, second thing now there's actually a lot of re- regulatory clarity. Today, for example, Leila, only 5% of regulators, only 5%, according to Cambridge University, are not, do not have somebody working on crypto. So there's from many, many cases, actually, many large financial centers right now, there is a regulatory clarity on crypto. We may not like the, the decision or the position, but at least there's clarity on that perspective. Uh, you know, and, and frankly, number three is broader educational topic. Uh, you know, so more and more people are educated on it, especially when it comes to institutional investors. Yes, the retail market is very important, but when you talk about the real capital flows, a lot of that happens from institutional investors. And there, we saw a drastic shift over the last 12 to 18 months. I mean, just to give you an example, according to the PwC report that was published last year, that crypto hedge fund report, uh, something, something just o- over 40% of crypto hedge funds surveyed in a, in a particular survey, either either already invested in crypto or are looking at investing in 2021 in crypto. And then we're talking here billions of dollars. Uh, and I can tell you that's really happening right now. So I think this shift is going to happen uh, quicker. I think there's been a couple of catalysts. The number one catalyst, and frankly, the most important was the COVID, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, not only the crisis per se, but also the record levels of quantitative easing that took place subsequently, the money printing, if you if you want, and that really yes. made people question about not only what is money, but also what is inflation, what is the risk of potential currency uh, devaluation or even hyperinflation, and all these brought, uh, let's say, assets like Bitcoin and digital assets back in the forefront way sooner than I think many of us expected it. And how about those who don't have a portfolio just yet? Maybe those newer investors who might just be entering into that space. Your book, uh, your latest book, The Future of Finance, and also uh, your YouTube channel, The Crypto Capsule. Who's that audience aimed for? And how do you get to those people who may not even have cryptocurrency in their lexicon today? Correct. Oh, well, you know, it's interesting. I think all of us, so we know we produce content, any kind of content, you know, including yours, you have always an audience in mind. Uh, for me, the decision from early on was to focus on really the institutional market. So actually my main channel, which is very unique, actually, not many people do this, is LinkedIn. 
So as you mentioned at the beginning, I have over half a million followers on LinkedIn. Even my newsletter that has now over 45,000 weekly subscribers uh, is, has been grown, I think, 30% in the last quarter is via LinkedIn as well. And that was a very deliberate choice when I started producing educational content on, on the internet is was not to really focus on YouTube initially, not focus on Twitter like many others do or TikTok and others, but really LinkedIn because my I believe that the people uh, that currently are working in finance, working in banks, working in other various types of companies, that is the audience I wanted to target. And there was a very, uh, very specific reason for it. Uh, one of them, you know, if you work today in a bank, uh, very, very likely YouTube, Facebook, Twitter is all banned at the office. You cannot, you cannot put it on. Frankly, if you have Facebook on at your workplace, probably you'll get, uh, you get some, uh, uh, criticism. Whereas LinkedIn. In most it's, places, it's, yes. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, uh, so that's, that's one thing I want to reason to focus on LinkedIn, although probably their platform, to be fair, it was not uh, the best and they always lag a couple of years compared to some of their more B2C focused peers. So that was really the market I've been targeting. Uh, more recently, I've been really branching out to try to address the broad other population, especially uh, by translating different languages. Uh, the reason we translate into uh, uh, Chinese, for example, is to reach that you know hundreds of millions of Chinese who live overseas who want to learn about crypto. Uh, again, I don't, I, never, I don't produce any content for mainland China uh, for regulatory reasons, uh, but also if I, uh, Spanish. You know, uh, we produce uh, content in Spanish now for the 400 million Spanish speakers and Arabic for 350 million Arabic speakers around the world. And I think well, one thing we often forget. Is while there's a lot of great English content on the internet, if you speak fluent English, you have a lot of content on crypto. What I find interesting is languages in French, Arabic, for example, across the Middle East, there's very little content. French across, we don't forget France, think about the African continent where right. people often need the most this education, they don't have access to it. And give me one example. Last year, I, I did a, a MOOC uh, online course on the introduction to fintech. And that course uh, that is part of the edX platform, which is uh, uh, that gives a course for free, we have over 100,000 students registered from 200 countries. And this really shows the potential of the internet and how you can impact people. I'm actually, one of the things I'm working on in the next month is we're creating our own MOOC, my own MOOC on crypto, again, that will be distributed around the world, again, to try to empower as many people on the future of finance and on the future of money as well. Fantastic. You have a young daughter. She must be pretty well versed in crypto. <laughs> yeah, I have two young kids actually. And they're very, uh, <laughs> they learn, you know, it's uh, one of the, actually one of the other projects I'm working on, and we're gonna announce it soon is actually a children's book as well, where we're trying to really actually come up with kids. I mean, my, my next book is obviously as a, a target for audience, a mature, educated audience, but also I think for kids. Uh, you know, uh, the the reason I start teaching universities. Uh, was really for, not that I have nothing else to do, was really because I find it's unacceptable. We let, in today's age, students graduate out of business schools and finance programs with no courses on blockchain or crypto or fintech, which I find is unacceptable, especially that they're the generation who will be most impacted from these changes. And I think the same applies to the younger generation, you know? Uh, and this is why actually I'm working on, on, a, on a children's concept now. We're going to make the details public in the next couple uh, weeks and months, uh, but really try to address and actually try to educate or at least get them interested on some of these topics, I'm sure any mother or father, you know, instead of reading kids' uh, uh, books on, uh, you know, everything we read about animals and other stuff, concepts in a very user, uh, child-friendly way. I can tell you one thing, Leila, that I learned is actually making kids' book is way more difficult than making a book for adults uh, because really how you communicate, how you make it interesting and exciting is way more complicated than people think. It really made me appreciate the efforts involved in uh, what the children's book authors do. What do you think is the first lesson, uh, crypto aside, but what do you think is the first lesson in finance that you would teach young children through your books, through your teachings? I, actually, the first lesson I would, I would uh, if I could, I could teach uh, kids would be actually broader financial education. Uh, yeah. For example, the importance of saving, the importance of uh, uh, investing early, even the, even concepts like interest rates. What is compounding? What is interest rates? And this, I think, this is not only children, but I think this is a problem of many emerging markets. Uh, as we speak right now, I'm recording this from Armenia, for example, which is the case, by the way, in many emerging countries, even post-Soviet republics or other more developing countries. The concept of why you need to save money. And why you actually have to invest it, get a, what is the notion of interest rate, why you have to save, what is inflation, are concepts that are not taught across schools. Uh, you know, I find it's really unacceptable that we let, even, you know, in high schools, 
we don't teach kids about what is in, what is inflation. It's something that actually is happening right now. We're having record levels of inflation in many countries. And you know, this is people's purchasing power. And unfortunately, I think people are educated. They can hedge themselves and you can invest. They'll be okay. But you know, the average worker doesn't know these concepts. I think that's a big failure that we have as a society is we're not educating people on these topics. Okay. You know, so I think that's the first thing I think we need to do. But the main thing I would do for people, frankly, is just listen. I think one problem that the financial ecosystem has not done, financial services has not done, is simply to shut up and to listen to what people have to say. I think many banking products today, many fintech products, not fintech, but financial services products are not made with a customer first mindset. Do not address the customer needs. And I think this is one, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see the fintech industry is looking at solving. I think that's very, very exciting. Listening to customers and building products that are customer first that, that really solve that problem. And that's super exciting. Here, here. Uh, so you mentioned that you communicate in many different languages, and that is such a, a big uh, portion of your business, your efforts, is to make sure that people in all countries around the world understand the future of finance. Um, I wanted to do something fun here. So you speak five languages, is that right? Correct, yeah. Okay. Different level. So here's a fun thing for our viewers. How do you say the future of money in each of those languages? <laughs> you know, it's funny how we say, you know, it's, it's funny actually, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about a lot of these topics are, are you know, uh, uh, are, are, are there, you know? So I, let's, let's kick it off, you know, el, el futuro del dinero, le futur de l'argent, le futur de la monnaie, trame, trame, abacan, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, I forgot which one I forgot, and the, the future of money, here we go. So I think a lot of these languages are there. You know, one thing that's interesting on the future of money, by the way, Leila, you know, it's a trademark name, you know? Yes. Uh, you know, when I was actually uh, working on my next book, I tried to see actually to make it uh, use the name. And uh, believe it or not, a company uses has a trademark on the name The Future of Money, which I think personally is unacceptable on such a concept. No company, no private company should be allowed to have a right. trademark, which is quite shocking, actually. And uh, I don't know what we should do. Maybe as a community, we should try to address this. But uh, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, data point that I just discovered that, a couple weeks absolutely. ago. Absolutely. Absolutely. So do you have to pay royalties to uh, the people who hold that trademark? Uh, I don't know. Frankly, uh, you know, it's actually pretty broad. The trademark that was done, it's actually, uh, I mean, anybody can look this up. It's, it's public, but it's an events company that owns it. And actually they have basically on everything from events, newsletters, conferences. Uh, it's been, it's been registered as a trademark, which I'm very surprised was actually even granted in the first place. So that, here that you go. Very um, exactly. <laughs> that, that is but this very is something surprising. a trademark or IP lawyer needs to come up and uh, look at it into it. That's right. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. Um, and which language do you think, for you, has been the most useful in your career? Well, I think from a language perspective, of course, I think English is, is a sine qua non, mm-hmm. as they say. You know, you need to you need to speak it. And uh, I think having a fluent English today is going to be very, very essential for anybody. Uh, you know, I think the more than languages, personally, I find actually the cultural uh, elements are very, very important, you know, like what goes around it, you know, the culture elements are, you know, in Chinese, they call it wunhua, you know, the whole culture element that is behind is very, very important because I think while um, you can speak a language and frankly, like, you know, everybody speaks it, I think the culture elements behind become very important. A good example of this is French, you know, I was very fortunate to be born in a place, actually, all my education was in French, actually, uh, even my law school, my first degree in, in law. Uh, and I think there's a lot of culture elements that come when you're dealing with French people, for example, the French culture that goes with it. Same thing with China, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's a very interesting, you know, since I left, um, you know, I've been living in Hong Kong now for since 2008. And actually, believe it or not, I speak probably more French uh, in, in Hong Kong than I do um, a Mandarin Chinese. And, you know, so it's very, very interesting how things uh, th- things evolve. Uh, and I lost a lot of my Chinese for a lot of my Mandarin. But um, one thing that remains is, you know, there's a cultural elements that are very, very ingrained that you learn just by living in a country, uh, you know, and having to speak it. And I think that's that's very, very important. Uh, you know, one thing I do with my kids and um, is uh, and I think it's also the cultural element is very important. One thing I do personally with my kids, for example, I only speak in Armenian with them. I believe it's very important never to forget where you're coming back, where you're coming from and your roots. And this is why I make a point. Actually, my daughter speaks to me in another language. I just don't respond. So if she wants something, she needs to tell me in, in, in Armenian. And I think this is why I, I'm, you know, I'm very focused on teaching my kids French and Chinese as well, by the way, which I think is very, very important. I think if there's one skill you can give to your kids, 
is uh, the master of language, especially when they're young, by the way, Absolutely. because, you know, it becomes very, very complicated later on in life. And uh, I think uh, people in the U.S. and other Western countries have been very lucky. The U.S. has become the, the lingua franca of the world. Uh, but I think, you know, it's going to be very interesting to watch how that is challenged over the coming years as other nations are rising up and, you know, taking a more important place on the, glo- on the global scene. Well, there came a time in some recent history where children and currently are learning Mandarin Chinese. Do you think that that is the way to go? Do you think that is certainly a language that younger generations who are not from that region should be learning? Absolutely. If you tell me what is the one thing I think any children right now in the Western world should learn? Is yeah. definitely Mandarin Chinese, you know. Exactly. Uh, you know, in the same way that every uh, Chinese student in uh, wherever in mainland China will learn English, uh, I think it's it's very important that anybody do. I think for your kids, especially, I think the younger, the existing generation, if you're over the age of forty now, you'll be fine, you know. But I think especially the next generation, the learning, mastering Chinese, especially understanding the Chinese culture will be very, very important as well. Uh, yeah. This is why, you know, I think we make a, a big point. That's just one thing I, with my kids, you know, uh, we even have uh, Chinese tutors coming in. There's, I think thankfully now it's become very easy in many countries around the world. There's Confucius Institutes uh, and the likes. Uh, I think learning those languages as a, as a young person are very useful. And for very one thing very important as well, it breaks the taboos. I think, unfortunately, everybody, every country, by the way, is kind of... Uh, a bit, uh, you know, looks down other countries or they think there's a better or they often, there's often misunderstanding of cultural elements. And I think the beauty of learning languages opens up a whole new door uh, to, to that, you know, and, uh, you know, I think it's been it's been very, it's very, very important on that perspective. Uh, if I think in, in the mastery of languages, I wish that's something they would do more in the U.S., to be honest. Uh, I think that's one yes. gap in the United States right now is the big focus on in the U.S. And if somebody speaks Spanish, it's like, whoa, you know. Uh, but however, I think the uh, the openness to the world is going to be very, very important. Yes, I, I completely agree. As someone who's been brought up in the United States and had an American education, I can definitely say it wasn't until I was older that I desired to learn French. Uh, but of course, unless you're immersed in it, you forget much of it. So, the, and like you say, the older you get, the harder it is. Um, after watching your videos and after this interview, you are an absolute natural at being on camera. You also are a public speaker. Uh, wondering what that experience is like getting out in front of an audience and sharing all of your knowledge and getting across the information that you want to get across. Absolutely. I think one of the most important skills in life is actually being able to speak in public. It's a st- what I call the storytelling. You know, I tell people whenever I'm pitching, when I'm talking, I'm, I'm actually a storyteller. And this is something that the journalists do very well. Uh, but I find that in many uh, schools and universities have failed on this topic. And actually, particularly in China, there's one criticism I have a lot, uh, you know, uh, having studied in China, I've been through the process as well. I think it's one thing that many uh, universities traditionally will focus on memorizing or learning hard skills. Uh, but again, don't focus on the storytelling. This is actually in all my courses that I teach in university. The final grade is a presentation. And that's what it's based on. Uh, I think public speaking is absolutely important, critical in life. I often say uh, what you know is very important, who you know is very important. And if you're able to tell a story, and then you're actually a superstar. And this is obviously, as you mentioned, I do a lot of storytelling, a lot of public speaking. And actually, people often don't realize the amount of time and effort that goes into it. Actually, on my YouTube channel, I have what I have a series called Behind the Capsule. Like it's a basic behind the scenes videos where I have a crew follow me how I prepare to give public speeches, how I prepare to be a moderator, how I prepare to be, uh, for example, how I prepare to film my videos on social media. So again, I try to empower as many people by showing how I do it behind the scenes. For example, a keynote is very interesting where uh, obviously I travel around the world, the pre-COVID especially, to give a lot of these speeches. uh, And, uh, you know, even it's a speech that I've given 50 times, you know, 100 times that year. I will still target it, tweak it for that particular audience, and I will rehearse it at least once or twice my morning before the presentation. And I think whenever you spend that time, the effort, uh, it really the audience will appreciate. My rule has always been, let's say if I'm giving a keynote, even people listening to this session today, this video today, if they you des- des- decided to dedicate t- half an hour of your life to listen yes. to what we have to share, I better give you value. And because if you know it's, it's a precious time, you're never going to get back. And if you have that focus on always giving value on your audience, your mm-hmm. audience will always appreciate. Often people tell me, Henry, how did you build this audience of half a million followers in only a couple of years? And I can tell you it's this focus, obsession with giving value to an audience. I'll give you one very simple example. I have my weekly show that you mentioned before, Leila, which is a crypto capsule. 
which is a 60 second summary of what is happening uh, in the crypto world that week. I, I love the succinctness, by the way. I, I love how succinct it is. And it's so geared towards today's average viewer, too, with the attention span that we all have. <laughs> and, and you're, you're spot on, Dika Leila, because what happens is that uh, actually people often don't realize doing a 60 second video is way more difficult than a six hour video, for example, or a 60, six minute video. Yes. And it takes me about That's six true. hours now to do that 60 second video. And by the way, this is thing that I do on my own, on my, on my uh, weekends, on my spare time. And obviously now I have a crew that helps me uh, to produce these videos. Uh, but I think uh, that is the respect of your audience. And the way that started actually was my, my goal was that if somebody gets in a typical elevator, let's say in Hong Kong and New York or in London, that time you're in the elevator, which, by the way, I think is one of the most anti-social spaces we have right in modern society. If somebody's going to look on their phone, I better give them value in that 60 second, deliver the content they need to know. And right. uh, the show, actually, we're going we're gonna to do our 100th episode, believe it or not, in the next couple of weeks. So very excited about the success that show has had. That's amazing. Congratulations on that. Well, Henry, you have ensconced yourself in an industry as an expert. You're extremely studied. You have a distinguished resume. Any mistakes along the way? <laughs> well, first of all, you refer to me as an expert, Leila. The one piece of advice I give to everybody in crypto or blockchain is whoever tells you they're an expert, you got to run away. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you, uh, I, 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 I spend 24-7 of no. my time in this space and I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen for one, one month from now. I mean, literally, if you look at what happened in the crypto space uh, in the last couple of weeks and days, it's been absolutely incredible uh, what has been happening from, from, uh, from that perspective, right? Um, so yeah, you're asking a mistake. It's very interesting because uh, you know, often I think we all do mistakes in life, and of course, like many other individuals, I've done I've done my my fair share. If I could re go back in time, uh, one thing I would have loved to do is I'd actually spend more time in China. Actually, you know, I spent about right yeah, right over a year in, in Beijing at a time. Uh, you know, I studied Chinese at, at Beida at Beijing University. I went to do a degree in Chinese law at Tsinghua. And at the time, I was like, oh, no, I need to, I need to go back and I need to start earning money and I need you know I need to do, get into the real world pretty quickly. And in hindsight. I would have loved to spend, let's say, another year in China really to perfect my Chinese. Because I think often we forget as young people, those early years you have in your career are years where, you know, you're long on time. And, you know, you can, you can, you can afford to be, let's say, in a, in a shitty apartment or, eat, you know, eat your noodles at night and you'll be okay. Uh, and I think that's something that you get uh, that you disappears uh, o- over the years. Uh, I think I've done a lot of good things. You know, I've done a lot of my travels, my backpacking. I've, I've traveled to over 90 countries around the world. Uh, most of them literally having no money on a backpack and just, you know, uh, but I think you had the life experience. Frankly, if you tell me to do those same trips in the same conditions now, I would totally refuse, uh, right. you know, <laughs> but I think you, you learn a lot of these things along the way. Uh, but I think really uh, mastering some of these languages, I think, and spending more time in China for me would have been uh, uh, something, you know, it's very interesting because um, I remember when I went to China, uh, people told me, where are you going to China? And, you know, I have to say, I, I, I was very objective. You know, I was not there. I was not particularly interested in Chinese culture or history or Chinese calligraphy. A lot of people at the time were really for those, a lot of those reasons. Uh, I was really there because I believed in the potential of the country. Uh, and that's how I went to China. It's very, I have to say, it's very capitalistic reasons uh, that brought me to China. And actually, at the time, I was very surprised that uh, I was probably one of the few that was really there for that reason to see this Chinese dream uh, you know, and of course things have changed right since in the last uh, 15 years to 15, 20 years. Yeah. But uh, I think, uh, uh, I think that's one of the things I would love to do again, if I had the chance. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, it's Henry, I think you've certainly deserved a five-star accommodations wherever you go. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to ask you one more question before we get into our quick fire. Uh, what would you say is your biggest success? Oof, uh, I think, uh, honestly, I don't consider myself that I've been successful at any, any level or else, uh, again, I'll be complacent, uh, you know, and uh, which drives a lot of my teams, whether in my different jobs or uh, different roles, uh, mad because I always try to push the boundaries. I have to say the one thing that I, I'm particularly, you know, professionally, of course, I'm very uh, happy with some of the successes I've had, but I think there's much more to come uh, and hopefully, uh, but I would say that some of the personal brand building uh, was a big bet at a time, uh, you know, creating the social media content at a time. I got a lot of criticism when I started. Uh, for example, you know, uh, uh, over the years, I've had many, I would say hundreds of people reach out to me wanted to create their own social media content. Actually, for those in China, this is very common now. In China, you have influencers everywhere. But I think around the world, this concept of actually building your own content, building your own brand was very novel, especially in the field of finance when I started. And it's very lonely, I have to say. Anybody that starts, I know many, many people started based on, I gave them feedback. They do a couple episodes and then they stop. 
Why? Yes. Because, you know, the first, probably I would say the first one or two years, I will never forget. I would create a lot of content. I would work an entire weekend. I wouldn't go out, you know, uh, because of that, I didn't have close friends. I wouldn't, you know, go enjoy my life, enjoy my uh, brunch. Like people go on brunches and stuff. I never did that. I would work on these weekends and stuff. And um, what, I, what I would, that you work all weekend and you post some content that's on Monday and it gets zero traction. Right. And that is really tough because, you know, you feel that, you know, obviously you're sacrificing so much. And it goes on and on. And then at one point, the hockey stick phenomenon starts. And I think the one advice I tell people is you need to stay focused, 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 and continue on it. And I think that was the key success. Uh, and right now, obviously, my content has been, as you mentioned, some of the accolades that I've been giving recently, um, but trying to uh, build the brand uh, further and actually create, generate content. And I can tell you there's a lot of things we're working on. So I think for your viewers, there'll be a lot of surprises we'll announce over the next couple of weeks and months of new initiatives, always trying to break the barriers that are coming in. I think this is one thing I would say for a lot of people, especially young people. And I have a lot of videos on this, speeches that I give at the commencement ceremonies and, and, and other places on the internet as well, is um, I really believe, and this is quite controversial, especially for young people, I really believe that the culture of work-life balance is the biggest mistake you can make. If you're in your 20s right now and you're focused on work-life balance, if you like it, enjoy your life, may, may God be with you and you'll, hopefully you'll be okay. But I believe that's the era that actually if you double down and you work extra hard, you will reap the benefits later on. Uh, so this yeah. day, for example, I work every weekend. You know, I'm really focused. And I really believe that extra 10 or 20% that you give will give you that extra 30, 40% in the market. And that will set you apart from the competition. Sacrifices are required. And I think that's why I think for a lot of young people, if you're spending your weekends chilling out or watching Netflix, I think you're making a big mistake. If you spend that time instead, even doing educational courses, getting more degrees, learning creating some content, you know, and focusing on some of these elements. I think the, the impact, I was talking earlier about the importance of investing early. That effort you make, you make will compound uh, very quickly or quicker than you think. So uh, and I think that's one of the elements of success. Unfortunately, I believe in hard work. Uh, you know, I think there's a talent helps, but I think if the hard work, there's a pretty much correlation with the harder you work and the more successful you become in life. And I know that's quite controversial uh, more and more these days. But you know what? I, I admire and I appreciate that contrarian view to the work-life balance because that is something, especially here, it is such a, talk about a trademark phrase, work-life balance is something that is constantly on people's lips. How do you achieve it? How do you strive to make sure that you have a lot of fun in your life while earning? But the thing is, is life life is long and life can be short. And what would you rather be doing with your time? And I think achieving is something that uh, it tends to um, take a back seat sometimes. Uh, there's but certainly if you do what you love, Lassie, that's a point. If you could do something you love, uh, yes. I think then it's no mistake. That's, I think that's what's the sure. most exciting thing in crypto is that literally anybody who's speaking crypto uh, pretty much loves what they do. And this is right. what I find fascinating is, you know, if you tell me, Henry, we're going to do on a, what would you do on a Saturday night? Or if you go on the beach to relax, I guarantee you I'll be reading about crypto. Uh, that's the way I relax now is actually I write books yeah. about crypto. And this is really remarkable about the, the crypto space is that literally, first of all, it's 24-7, but everybody who works in this industry is generally passionate about changing the world, changing the world of finance. And I, I, I find it very difficult to find other industries like that. I can tell you the traditional banking space, that is mm -hmm. not the case. And I think this right. is why the crypto space is, because space is moving so quickly. It's not because of technological advancements, because the people in it, are not necessarily doing it for the money. They're doing it because they're passionate and want to change the world. And when you have that, you, you become unstoppable. Absolutely. Well, speaking of lightning pace, uh, we're going to do our quick fire. So about 20 seconds per question. So sure. uh, just uh, bear with me as we go through the list. If there's anything that's too embarrassing, just say skip. Are you ready? No problem. Okay, very good. What is the craziest thing you've ever done in your life? Oh, craziest thing I've done in my life, uh, I would say some of the travels that I've done, I've been some of the crazy countries around the world from not only the place like Bangladesh, India, traveling on like third class trains, but also places like North Korea, Syria. So I think some of these travels I've done, uh, I've even climbed uh, mountains, I climbed Mount Ararat in, in Turkey, which is not allowed if you're Armenian. So then some of these, I would say crazy trips over the last couple of years. Uh, okay. which I, I would never regret, frankly. I probably would never do again now that I get older, but uh, it was good to do them back in the day. Yes. Well, you're an adrenaline junkie. Um, what is your favorite film and why? Oh, favorite film and why? Um I'm not, a, I've, I've watched a lot of movies. I would say some of the movies that I've enjoyed a lot. I love a lot of these motivational, I would say, uh, movies that I've seen a lot uh, over the years. 
Um, and also, I would say uh, uh, some of the movies that really touched me, uh, I would say that some of the ones that touched me, like La Vida es Bella, a lot of movies about that actually affect people's lives. I'm trying to think recently what I've watched. I watch a lot of documentaries, to be fair. I watch yes. a lot of documentaries. One recent documentary series that I watched was about uh, Michael Jordan. Again, about the NBA Bulls back in the day. Again, shows you how Michael Jordan, despite being number one in the world, always said there's a, pl- there's a price of being number one. There's a price for success. It was the first one to practice, last one to leave. I think there's, there's a lot of the, I think, educational content from that perspective. So a big documentary uh, uh, watcher from that perspective. Yeah, wonderful. What is the biggest lie you ever told your mother? Uh, mother, that I was safe. Uh, one thing that happens a lot, my mother, like any other mother, worries a lot. Uh, so many times I had to get surgery, for example, once I was in Shanghai and had appendicitis. And I figured I had to go to immediate, immediate surgery. Uh, and I didn't want to tell my mom about it. So I told her I was going hiking for two, three days. So she doesn't hear about me and not to worry too much about it. And of course, that's what happened. I, I you know, I, I had the surgery and then I called her afterwards. It happened to me recently as well. I had to get another actually pretty uh, serious surgery a couple of months ago. Nothing, nothing major, but uh, I had to go under for, of course, for a couple of hours. And uh, I, I just told my mom, mom, you know, I'll be busy. I'll be offline. And uh, I, I, I only told her afterwards. So one thing I learned in life is that uh, p- um, uh, whatever people don't know, they cannot be afraid of. So I think if you tell her after the fact, I think it's all often better from that perspective. I think that's one piece of advice I would give to people as well. Uh, this, it's also contrarian, but I think I love to, uh, some things that uh, parents especially do not think in rational ways, they're very emotional. So in many yes. cases, uh, whatever you don't know cannot hurt you. So you're better telling them after the fact. That's very wise. That's very wise. What is the most embarrassing moment of your life? Oh, well, embarrassing. I've had uh, many uh, embarrassing moments over the years. I would say a lot of things that happened uh, you know, I think in many, uh, uh, many cases, you try to fake it until you make it in many cases, you know, in the early days, uh, that often will try to impact you. You know, when I was uh, young, for example, I remember I started to work as a DJ and, uh, you know, often we had so many stories where this would not work, uh, things would not, would not happen. Uh, I would say embarrassing moments happen quite a lot. Um, I would say a lot of performances, you know, I've done a lot of uh, times where I would go in my early days, for example, try to uh, uh, perform. I remember once at a UBS event, I went and I sang a song uh, uh, in Chinese, uh, you know, and uh, uh, and uh, it's a Chinese called Yuan Yang Dai Biao with a Xin. It means um, it's a very popular Chinese traditional song. And of course, I have, I have absolutely zero singing skills. Uh, as you saw, I speak very, la- very fast and I don't articulate very well which is a big trademark of mine. So that's one problem I've had. So trying to sing, uh, I think, is one of the biggest embarrassment, uh, unfortunately. But Henry, you do everything else. <laughs> I, I don't know that I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, we got to well, try, you know, pushing the boundaries all the time. Right? I think one thing always, I like to do is try always. things always. Uh, you know, one thing I tried this summer was uh, meditating, for example. And uh, yeah. I, one thing I've been trying to really get into is meditating, you know, I try to relax a bit. Uh, but, you know, I sat down with a meditating coach and uh, 20 minutes in, I told him, hey, listen, we have to launch a business of meditation. This is a great business with a high margin, with the really, uh, you know, very high, uh, uh, low capex. And uh, I think the poor meditation teacher didn't want to see me again. So uh, it, it is what it is. I think we always try to try to uh, push boundaries as much as we can. Indeed. In now, who would you prefer to run into a bar? Uh, Elon Musk or Lionel Messi, since he has expressed his excitement over blockchain. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of Argentina. You know, Messi, I've been a very big fan of Argentina. I've been there many, many times. I think it's actually a great country where crypto could be very beneficial, actually, from policymaking perspective. Uh, but definitely Elon Musk, uh, you know, honestly, is somebody where, uh, you know, I think he, what he's been achieving in the last couple of years, uh, I still remember when people made fun of electric cars, and he went ahead and he just did it. I think that's really remarkable. Bring people to space, for example. Uh, I think it's very, very remarkable. Very remarkable. So we'd love to have a chat uh, with him uh, if, if I could. I, w- I wouldn't mind, actually. That's one thing I've been... I think he's very wrong on crypto. I think some of his positions is crypto. Uh, frankly, it's a bit childish. Some of his things mm-hmm. he talks about, Dogecoin and Bitcoin, it's absolutely... In, if he was doing this in, in, in stocks, it would be criminal activity. You cannot talk about this uh, in the way he does, frankly. Uh, but uh, I think he'll be, he's a very interesting uh, fellow uh, I would love to meet. Definitely. Well, two more questions. When did you first fall in love? Oof, uh, don't tell my wife about this. No, I think uh, falling in love is a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, you know, I've been married now for many years. Uh, I think, you know, I think the concept of love is a very, um, uh, you know, romanticized topic. But I think love for me is, you know, when you know. 
uh, from that perspective. I think that's another thing with people, but also I think it's very important that you love other things in life as well. Uh, you can love your partner and the likes, but I think loving also what you do and what gives you purpose is very, very important. It's it's quite sad, actually. Uh, I get approached by a lot of people and, uh, you know, what to, now everybody, everybody, everybody wants to get into crypto. So once in a while, I, I always get a message, people saying, hey, Henry, can I pick your brain or can we meet up for a coffee? Uh, and, you know, a typical uh, request. And what I find is a lot of people are actually stuck in jobs they don't like, doing things they don't love, uh, just because of, let's say, paycheck or other benefits that they get. And I think when you, you're comfortable stepping outside your comfort zone, pushing those boundaries, actually asking for forgiveness, not permission, I think that really opens up. So I think the concept of love applies to many things in life, including, I think, what you do and what you, what you can do. And I find myself very privileged, actually, that I'm, you know, uh, you know, I was born in Canada, you know, live my life around the world, uh, that I have the privilege, actually, of doing what I want. And frankly, also, the, there's, there's a bit of luck involved. And this is why I tell people, especially Americans, you know, um, I think the one single denominator in your life, one thing that you have no control on, that has the biggest impact on your life is where you're born. I find it incredible that one thing that actually you have zero control determines the rest of your life. Today, if you're unlucky enough to be born in a country like Iran, Lebanon, Syria, North Korea, uh, it really has an impact for the rest of your life. And I think that the fact that people often have this, the fact that they're born in a country where they have the freedom, they can talk, they can do what they want, and they don't appreciate it. And what bothers me the most is they don't make the effort to reach their full potential. Uh, this was a problem I had in Canada when I, a lot of people that I know, you know, in Canada is a great country where, frankly, if you have zero money, there's a lot of government funding to make you achieve, go to university, reach your potential. The people, you know, get complacent with a comfortable life. You know, they get married, the kid, the dog, the minivan, uh, the Saturday night, they go to cinema, the same restaurant, that routine. And I find it's a, it's a shame that you're not able to reach your full potential when there'll be many others who would do, they would do anything, literally die, as we're seeing right now at the borders and what we saw in Afghanistan, to really have this opportunity to reach their full potential. If I could rewrite the role, I would make it a, a, a countries or businesses where you apply and countries decide who they want. And actually, uh, I think one of the biggest um, uh, uh inegalities in life is the fact that where you're born. And I wish one day I can change that where a country where people are valued because of uh, their skills and their, their motivation and their hardworking et- ethics, not because of the city where they're born, their passport. Again, something on which they have no control on. Absolutely. Now I could say that I know the answer to this next question, but I'll ask it anyways. Retirement, is this in your lexicon? And if so, what would that look like to you and where would you like to be? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I don't think about retirement. Also, I think the concept of retirement is actually very obsolete as well. Uh, in, the con- in the same idea, I think like people had back in the day, they would do a university degree for three years and then work for the rest of their lives. That idea is gone. I think you have to be a lifelong learner. You have to continue to reinvent yourself. And that also applies, by the way, as retirement. Um, I think there's a lot of things, the way they call it, the world is going, it's very likely we're going to live to be 75, 80, 85 and, and more. And I think you need to be productive. The whole model of retirement that you stop at 65 and you have savings uh, to rest uh, afterwards, it's already gone, by the way. Uh, and this is why I think we need to always reinvent ourselves. You know, I, start, I tell people I, I started myself as a lawyer. I became a banker. I became a consultant. And now God knows what I'm going into next. And I expect myself every five years to completely reinvent myself, completely. Uh, you know, and I think, uh, and that there's various, uh, inputs that come in into how you reinvent yourself. One of them actually is the, the notion of age and energy. You know, uh, my mom always used to tell me as a kid, there's three things in life that, that you have is time, energy, money, time, energy, money. It's a triangle. You always have two out of the three. You'll never have the three of them at the same time. You know, when you're young, for example, you have, you have energy and you have time, but you have no money. Later in life, when you're working, you know, you have, you have money and you have energy, but then you have no time. And then when you retire, often what's happening with people is they have the, the, the money and the time, but then they don't have the energy anymore. And I think if you're privileged to have, be able to have the intersection where you adapt your life accordingly, I think you'll have a very fruitful life. But I think the concept of retirement as a whole is, uh, is, is kind of a, will be comical in a couple of years when our children and our grandchildren think about the concept that something like a retirement even existed, you know? That, absolutely. Finally, Henry. If you could describe yourself in three words, <laughs> um, I would say uh, hard work, high energy, and high passion. 
Yes, I, I would agree with all of those. <laughs> you have boundless energy, Henry, and I, I would love just a fraction of it, quite frankly. But this has been such a pleasure speaking with you. I want to thank you so much for taking this time to answer all these questions and to help us introduce you to the world and, and all that you do. Thank you, Lily. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the BSN family for inviting me. Uh, it was a pleasure being on and sharing our passion, the future and the money and the future of finance with, with all of you. Thank you for making time and listening. I know you have a choice, so I appreciate it. Oh, goodness. Learn so much. Learn so much. And Henry, I hope we get to do it again. Pleasure. Henry Arslanian, thank you so much for joining us. This has been fun and enlightening and a real education. That's going to do it for us on this episode of Blockchain All-Stars. We'll see you next time. 